So I'm doing something a bit different. There was supposed to be one more Scorsese video on crime movies, but I was feeling burnt out from uploading one video a week and always stressed out about having a video out by the end of the week. I was overworking myself for no reason. So I'm going to cut back on that and have the entire filmography in one video instead of having multiple videos. Martin Scorsese's movies aren't the kind of movies that I would watch because I don't find them interesting at all. But I essentially forced myself to watch his entire filmography because I just wanted to see other things and not just watch Supernatural natural comic book movies and naruto over and over again and it was supposed to line up with killers of the flower moon but last time i checked the movie will debut in a film festival in 2023 so with the few movies that i didn't talk about here's my journey through martin scorsese's filmography new york stories is one movie that i wouldn't go back to watch not because it's bad but it's a movie i don't really care for it's an anthology movie and scorsese directs one of the three stories named life lessons it's about an artist that's a horrible person he wants to stay with his ex-girlfriend but she's clearly not interested anymore and only stays with them so that he can teach her more about painting he uses her for his own benefit when they go to that party showing other art and trying to make it and then doesn't allow any guy to talk to her because he's still infatuated with her he's just miserable both creatively and with his love life she eventually leaves but the cycle starts again with the new assistant coming in this guy's just stuck in this cycle because he needs to be in a destructive relationship in order to fuel his art the other two stories are directed by woody allen and francis ford coppola something like that which i don't find all too interesting life without zoe is just a girl trying to get her mother and father back together because she liked the way that things were before they got divorced and the oedipus wreck is a magic trick gone right but then comes back later to ruin sheldon's life as his mother is always critiquing his life the Age of Innocence is not for me. Daniel Day-Lewis and Riona Ryder are in an arranged marriage, but Michelle Pfeiffer comes in and messes things up for this already arranged marriage. Having to see Daniel a lot at everyone and going out to see Pfeiffer was just fine. Didn't really feel anything about it. When I was watching it, I want to watch something else, but I was like, you know what, I'll just watch it, just kind of push through it. Kuden is a well-made and well-acted movie. The only issue is that like with the other two movies, I kind of care less about a boy that would be a political and spiritual leader of Tibet. They were treated horribly by China because they see religion as a poison and use that as a way to treat them as inferior to the rest of China and plan to assassinate Tenzin. They weren't allowed to just be themselves or live because of their beliefs. They just had to be bothered by the country, just couldn't leave them alone. Hugo is not a movie that I would expect Scorsese to direct. I expect a lot more mob movies because if I didn't know Scorsese directed this, then it's like any other fantasy and drama movie. Not fantasy, but it feels like it because the movie follows Hugo writing in his father's notebook and watching Charlie Chaplin movies and homaging not only Chaplin, but movies made back in the 20s and 30s. And then Isabel wanted to tell his story. It's nothing special. You're following Hugo and seeing how hard it is to live where he is. I wish the movie was more about homaging Chaplin and the other movies. I just thought that was way more interesting thing then whatever was going on with him and holy grace Moretz and whatever was going on who's that knocking on my door is his first movie and it's decent it feels like scorsese got a bunch of his friends and thought about an idea for a movie and then just shot them doing whatever it tells the story of a girl who's been sexually assaulted and seeing the reaction from her boyfriend he's weirded out by it and it may be due to him being religious he thought of marrying her but then once she brings it up he thinks she's tainted or spoiled and again it's weird reaction he should have been more just supportive and not just abandon her and then later on apologize but then that doesn't work out because he can't let go of the past trauma and both go their separate ways anytime religion is a part of a movie it will go over my head because i'm just not into that but the last temptation of christ works for me because of willem dafoe he is so skinny and frail and fears most things in the movie that he works as jesus i don't know much about jesus all i know is that he was hung on a cross and there's a religion surrounding him that's it i don't know if this movie pissed off christians or not this is a story about doubts fears and especially lust jesus is tempted by imagining himself engaging in sexual acts but fights that because it's wrong satan also gets involved which i didn't know he was going to be involved and while i like the movie a lot of it is just again going over my head so i'm just watching this from an outside perspective and it's a decent movie new york new york is a musical and robert de niro is a constant and important part to scorsese's filmography he's great in this movie and is having a lot of fun he's a saxophone player and meets singer francine i initially thought because it's a musical both characters would meet and fall in love in the process of being on stage but luckily it wasn't that both do fall in love but francine had to stop because she became pregnant and had to stop chasing her dreams de niro didn't kept going on stage and sort of left francine he saw her as an obstacle that was in the way but once francine got her life back together she was was able to go back on stage because it's never too late to do what you want and love. 
Boxcar Bertha is another one where I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna like this or not because it's a romance movie, but while the romance is there, it's not the main focus. I was watching a group of criminals that were on the run because they don't like the way things work, so they just take whatever they want. And because they're following them, they're still betrayed as humans. A lot of the time, a criminal in a movie or TV show, they're just usually one note. But since this is their movie, they have to be interesting or at least relatable in some way. There's a certain point in the movie where Bertha gets out and she lives a normal life, but she doesn't like it. She liked the way that things were with Bill in the group, but the law catches up and gets rid of all of them except Bertha and crucifies Bill for being an outlaw, being a criminal, not following the law. These are criminals technically, but they still feel human. They just want to live life differently, but still, you know, doing pretty bad things. You have a young Tom Cruise in The Color of Money who is an up and coming pool player that's great at it which also means that he's a bit cocky and sometimes will talk shit to players and then on the other side you have an older player who has the itch to come back named Eddie. He's been retired for a bit but after seeing how Tom Cruise played he wants to drop everything and go join the tournament to become the best pool player. He left his wife and family but then later on she comes back around to support him because pool is a big deal for him. Tom always had his girlfriend Carmen next to him to distract some of the players she tries seducing Eddie and I was worried because this might be the catalyst that causes Eddie and Tom to hate each other but luckily it wasn't that. Eddie was using Tom to get in the finals and cause tensions but in the end put their differences aside until the end and see who's better which is left unanswered because that's where the movie ends and Eddie has the better arc where he's not able to move on and still wants to play pool even though he's somewhat past his prime. Alice doesn't live her anymore. At first glance, I thought it was going to be about Alice becoming a singer and it wasn't that at all. The movie is about how your dreams are put on hold because life gets in your way. Alice planned on becoming a singer but her husband passed away so that means she has to work a lot harder for income while at the same time taking care of her son. And it's hard trying to be a single parent and then working only to get by and stay in hotels. There's even one point in the movie where she tells her son to get out of the car and she just vents and yells because it just doesn't seem fair that she's going through all of this. The movie is sort of like a road trip movie as they have to go town to town. She meets guys along the way but each time she opens up to them something bad comes up like one of them hit her son but then that same guy comes back to apologize and she allows them to come back. This is the only issue that I have with the movie. I don't know whether it's because she got tired of having to live the life that she had and just needed anyone to help her or she really does think that this guy is good for her and her son. Kind of forgave him hitting her son really quick. Like with the temptation of Christ, all of the religious stuff just went over my head in silence but I like silence a bit more because of Andrew Garfield. He has to deal with religion in Japan but also in a way getting expelled as well because Japan doesn't seem to like foreigners in their country and use religion as a way to cast them out. Both Andrew and Adam Driver are looking for Liam Neeson. Throughout the movie, I thought he was pretty much dead but he decides to denounce God and spare his life and live with the rest of Japan which means that religion was never kind of a big thing for him because he would have kept to his like beliefs and not just be like, okay, you know what? I care more about my life. Andrew Garfield on the other hand decides to die and still remain a Christian never letting Japan cloud his beliefs. The Irishman is this recent movie and it's another mob movie which I don't know if I needed to see another one after seeing Casino and Goodfellas. This one is surrounding Jimmy Hoffa who I only know because of the true crime videos on YouTube. He just disappeared after getting inside a car and the movie explores the events of what led up to his disappearance. I do remember the CGI faces were a big thing because some of it looks a bit weird but for the most part I wasn't really bothered by it. As long as the movie has good writing or anything else then I'm willing to look past the weird and bad CGI. De Niro is friends with Jimmy and they eventually become like family and De Niro has the picture with him and his daughter. Tensions rises between the mob and it leads to De Niro having to get rid of Hoffa and his trust is tested and sadly he does break his trust and gets rid of Jimmy Hoffa. Then in the present day De Niro finishes his narration. He's alone looking at the picture writing that he betrayed the only family he had. The movie is a bit long. There were four times where I checked my phone because I felt like there were scenes that were just dragging a bit. Mean Streets is a low stakes movie that involves New York and the Mafia and I like this part of the movie but also found myself somewhat checking out because it's a Mafia movie. I'd rather watch Scorsese's other Mafia related movies and low stakes nature of the movie is good but there's Taxi Driver and After Hours. So there's just other movies in Scorsese's filmography that I'd rather watch. You're following Charlie and he's the middleman. He's trying to keep the peace between the Mafia and the Loan Shark and he's also Catholic so he's torn and feels any choice that he makes it's going to be wrong. He's 
cheating and having an affair with Teresa and both are involved in a car crash. Both are fine but De Niro is nowhere to be found. De Niro is easily the best part of this movie. He's exploding mailboxes and just having a great time. And this is the first movie where De Niro and Scorsese were together and Scorsese would just continue to bring him back. Gangs of New York is a revenge movie. Leonardo DiCaprio is also another actor that works well with Scorsese who is seeking revenge against Bill the Butcher who's pretty damn good in the movie. He killed DiCaprio's father. He spent some time with Cameron Diaz but there's this one guy named Johnny who becomes jealous and knows DiCaprio's true identity and reveals it to Bill. DiCaprio has to blend in and get closer to Bill. The mob runs all of New York and has no value to it anymore because everyone or not everyone but most people are corrupted and if there's a fight it will eventually lead to more more violence. It's like the Wild Wild West but set in New York and the mob runs everything. DiCaprio kills Bill and brings Cameron Diaz with him to leave and live a new life somewhere else. I got spoiled on Shutter Island and it was my fault. In high school, I went to the library to complete an essay that was due when lunch was over. I decided not to finish it the day before, but eventually I did. And with the free time that I had, I signed into my YouTube account and just watched some top 10 videos. And one of those videos were top 10 twists in movies. Shutter Island was one of them. DiCaprio was one of the patients. And so going in to watch the movie, a lot of the times I did look for clues in the background, which isn't the best way to watch a movie because you're also missing some of the movie as well. The old lady in the beginning shushing DiCaprio in the beginning was really the only one that was a clue or at least I think it was a clue. If I wasn't spoiled I would have taken everything at face value. There's no reason to believe that DiCaprio is a patient. He was never able to get over killing his wife and his kids drowning and kept running away from it. Both Mark Ruffalo and Ben Kingsley were good as people who helped DiCaprio get over his past trauma. Casino is about the rise and fall of Vegas. On one hand, this is a cool story. On the other hand, Vegas and gambling is something that's just not interesting to me. The mob had total control over Vegas. If someone was stepping out of line, then everyone knew and let that person know not to slip up again. But slowly as the movie progresses, De Niro and Nikki's relationship start to break apart. Sharon Stone gets involved and then once De Niro dead, these characters are bad people. But also like them because it's fun watching them get away with stealing money or beating a person, which is pretty violent when Nikki and his friends and get beat with the bat. It's brutal. De Niro's also narrating again. Starts with him quote unquote dying in a car explosion and then by the end we go back to him and he lives and is the only one who survived. Sharon Stone died of a drug overdose. Nikki died with his friend with a bat. Vegas is no longer run by the mob but now by a corporation which in De Niro's words is Disneyland Vegas. No one really knows each other anymore and it is watching I was like man this is kind of like Disney. Disney has a lot of IP right now with the, like the Fox merger so like what if Disney really does just like have everything that would not be a good day at all i thought the aviator was gonna be about planes based on the poster decapper has sunglasses and he looks cool reminds me of top gun but it wasn't really about that the first half is this happy love story between decapper and kate blanchett both seem really happy and decapper on the outside seems fine but once kate leaves him and he's alone the second half of the movie dives into how he avoids germs like people and actual germs as well he doesn't really want to be part of the world or put himself out there even though he's well known and a filmmaker he has an inner struggle of wanting to be isolated from the rest of the world in the end he does open up a bit to finally going outside but it's not concrete that he'll open up for the rest of his life the movie is also about old hollywood and for me it was cool but also can we like move on from this Bringing Out the Dead tells the story of a paramedic descending into madness just by the nature of his job, seeing people die, working late hours, driving around a rough neighborhood. The reason this movie is this high is because of Nicolas Cage. After going through his filmography, I really like him now. He starts off fairly normal and agrees to help save Patricia Arquette's father, but over time he loses his sense of reality. Cage gets into a car crash and he just gets up with his co-worker like it's nothing, just laughs it off, thinks about killing Patricia's father who isn't really going to make it. So with Cage seeing all kinds of things, instead of bringing her father back he needs to end his suffering he's been seeing a lot of people coming in and on the outside as well with homeless people and sex workers and he doesn't want to see any more suffering cage goes to patricia's place and both accept death the departed would have been higher if the ending was Bat Damon getting away from the mob and being the mole inside the police force. Would have been a very bold ending, but the bad guy can't win in the end. DiCaprio is a mole within the mob while Matt Damon is a mole within the police force and both have to lie out of their asses for a lot of this movie. And while there's clearly a good and bad side, both feel the same way of wanting out. DiCaprio is freaking out about going inside the mob. Matt Damon is lying to Vera Farmiga and she gets involved into why he's so distant. Alec Baldwin and Mark Wahlberg 
Wahlberg are in this movie, and I'm assuming it was intentional, but both are funny in the movie because they're being hard ass asshole cops. DiCaprio uses Vera as leverage against Matt Damon and subverts their expectations when DiCaprio is killed off and he's free now, but Matt Damon is still stuck and also gets shot in the head. So now both are, I guess, free of their burden of lying and wanting out. After hours tells the story of Paul Hackett's worst day ever. He works an office job and he's like, you know what? I want to go on a date because I'm bored. So he goes on a date and the girl isn't at her place. Her roommate is and already she's giving off super weird vibes. She's making a clay sculpture and is also seducing him. And the entire time, it's just weird. I thought maybe he's getting catfish or got tricked into getting robbed or something. But the girl he's going on a date with finally shows up. But then the girl also has some issues that she's dealing with and commits suicide, leaving Paul to be the only son suspect he leaves and goes to a bar and conveniently meets the boyfriend of the girl that he's supposed to go out with that's the only issue with this movie most things are convenient by this point he wants to go home but can't get by the subway he rejects an older lady and gets everyone to find and beat him gets inside of a clay and newspaper sculpture but then gets robbed and again conveniently drops where he works and comes back around all these weird things happen in the after hours of the day I thought I didn't know anything about Goodfellas, but it turns out I know only one scene, which is the prison scene. I think I saw the scene on Binging with Babish, but they're in prison and somehow still doing pretty damn good. Cutting garlic, onions, and getting access to a kitchen in prison. No one bothers them at all. Henry is the main character and he narrates the movie, which Scorsese loves using, but Henry wants to be a gangster, meaning that he wants to take and do anything that he wants at any time. He gets involved with the wrong crowd, meets De Niro, see how things are done when you don't want to follow orders and at a certain point they're untouchable they can do whatever they want but the murder of bats gets tommy killed henry is in a relationship with karen and he cheats on her and both almost die because of de niro henry starts having a drug addiction and the normal and boring life that henry wanted to avoid catches up to him and has to live the normal life by the end the avengers of taking whatever you want killing people and getting rid of them is no more Taxi driver is a lot more than De Niro being a taxi driver and meeting different people from different walks of life. He becomes a taxi driver after coming back from the war and there's nothing done for him. No one is making sure that he's okay. He's left alone and has to suck it up and try to move on for more. Because of this, he sets out to save the world and save Jodie Foster as well from prostitution. Both are stuck in a place of needing help, but the people who have the power just don't want to help. De Niro's also able to go on a date and be fine, which I thought would have gone bad. He doesn't really socialize sort of in his own head for a lot of the movie he tries to assassinate the president but fails and then doesn't get caught he's able to somehow get by save Jodie Foster but isn't able to save himself or get help as he's still a taxi driver by the end of the movie Raging Bull is about ego and insecurities. De Niro has everything in the beginning of the movie. He was a well-known boxer who always won, had a beautiful wife named Vicky, Joey always had his back, and most of his life was pretty chaotic. However, there's one major issue and person that ruins it. It's him. He starts becoming jealous and insecure about Vicky he hangs out with. I'm assuming getting hit in the head a bunch of time causes his random fits of rage to Vicky, previous girlfriend, and Joey. Because of these behaviors, he pushes everyone close to him away. Joey doesn't have his back anymore, which which means that he's losing matches and he only counts a loss if he's knocked out. Vicky wants a divorce and custody of their kids and now he's left alone. All these events took place from 1941 through 1964. If he was just not, I guess, a raging bull, then everything would have been good. He's doing stand up by the end and maybe he's changed after all of this. At least I would like to think that he's able to have an introspection and learn from his mistakes. The King of Comedy is sort of like Scorsese telling everyone else how the industry works. De Niro wants to be on TV and have his 15 minutes of fame because he thinks he can make it. But then he finds out that just asking to be on isn't gonna work. There's a system and the people in the higher ups clearly don't care about what he wants. He consistently goes to the office because of his super naive perspective. He's also a bit delusional. He has his own late night show set up at his place and talking to himself. He's on a date and all he's doing is talking about himself and what he wants to do. Not asking the girl about her or what she does. So he doesn't get what he wants he just has to kidnap jerry langford who's a host on the late night show and forces him to get him a spot on tv the police and everyone involved agrees to de niro's request he makes it on tv and he kills it he's really good and i thought the movie was going to end in a very bleak way where he gets his 15 minutes of fame and then goes to prison or jail and is forgotten about but everyone who saw him kept asking for him and after he gets out he has books posters and his face is everywhere so despite being naive and not knowing how things work his 15 minutes of fame worked out in the end. 
the Wolf of Wall Street is a lot of fun. DiCaprio decides to steal from the rich with scam calls and then it would eventually lead to having a big ass office and hiring a lot of people. The work culture is pretty chaotic. The movie opens up with people throwing a little person on a bullseye target and honestly office job had this much fun for most if not the entire work hours then I would happily work an office job. The only issue is that they're scamming people and the people with power aren't the best. Jonah Hill is introduced as an awkward and timid character and as the movie goes along he becomes more of an asshole. He eats a guy's fish which he shouldn't even have brought in the first place and then fires him because he was stepping out of line. He gets John Berthold in trouble because he got punched by him and he just couldn't get past that. Couldn't stand the fact that he was put in his place. So seeing his progression was fun. DiCaprio has everything. Lots of money. Fun but really chaotic messed up work culture. Got Margot Robbie. Like what could possibly go wrong? Well over time she doesn't want to be with him anymore. Jonah Hill starts to ruin relationships with John Berthold and others that would lead to their downfall and both getting drugged which was a scary but also fun part. Both trying to move and finding different ways of function and then if they're not careful then a lot of people would be hurt. He almost killed his kid and it's the final straw for Margot Robbie. DiCaprio is addicted to drugs and is a part of why things didn't work out. Drugs were used in the office at his house and both Jonah and DiCaprio used the drug in the end. He's eventually caught and goes to prison for stealing and not paying for taxes. After that he has a normal life and is working as a host to make his living because he's great at giving speeches or like a lot of fun. It's all like bullshit but it's like yo you know what you're really good at pitching stuff and just giving a really damn good speech. Keep Fear is my favorite movie from Scorsese. It has the fun with De Niro having the time of his life after getting out from prison and decides to mess with this defense lawyer. And then it's also scary in some parts because he's showing up to Sam and his family's house, giving them their mail and seducing their underage daughter. The first thing that made this number one for me was that theater scene. The family's trying to watch a movie and you have De Niro who comes in, starts laughing and just continues until Sam notices who he is. De Niro's finding loopholes around the law so that he can continue to torture them. He does get to their daughter at a point where she says he ain't so bad. He wouldn't do anything to hurt me. Already has her. But in the end she realizes that he's kind of crazy. I also love that they home alone in their own house. Sam shutting the windows is a clip that I've seen before. I think I saw it in a YouTube video or maybe maybe it was Twitter. I don't know. De Niro brings them out on a boat and Sam and their family are left with only one option. They have to kill or Sam has to kill him. And he does but obviously the family is not going to be the same after this. You don't just get over killing another person, getting stalked, assaulted and for the rest of their lives they will see or hear De Niro's laugh even though he's dead already And that was it for Martin Scorsese's filmography. There's not a single bad movie that he's directed. The bottom four movies are movies I just don't care about. Before going through the movies, I thought I was gonna get a ton of mafia movies with the fine first movie because all I heard was Casino, Goodfellas, and Taxi Driver. But Scorsese has a diverse set of movies and I'm glad that it wasn't just mafia movies. Scorsese shows that he can do a lot more than that. He can tell the story of a single parent struggling to get by or a guy going on a weird ass date and then having the worst day of his life and he can even do comedy. So that is it for me and this has been The Road So Far.